Koto, Harimai, um, a very warm welcome uh, to the Space for Planet Earth Challenge Finals. We have so many wonderful people joining from across Australasia and the world. Um, a warm welcome to our sponsors, to our speakers, our finalists, our partners, and judges. My name is Amy Armstrong, and I'm very happy to be your host for this evening's event. As a fellow Edmund Hillary fellow, I've had the opportunity to see the great work of Space Base and of Emmeline, Eric, and Rich um, over the past few years, including being a judge on a previous challenge. And I think the work that they do to leverage space technology to accelerate climate action, and, and importantly, to build the capacity of others to leverage space technology for climate action is admirable and crucial. You all know that we are in a climate emergency. Uh, 2023 was the hottest year on record, and the impacts of a changing climate are being felt all around us, undermining our natural ecosystems, posing significant health risks for our communities, stressing our infrastructure and food systems, and contributing to division and civil strife. My day job is working in partnership with coastal communities across the Pacific region to accelerate climate planning, and I see these impacts play out day in and day out. The good news is that there are incredibly talented, dedicated leaders on the ground, researchers in the lab, and a growing number of solutions being shared and implemented. We need to continue to work together to engage a broad community of researchers and invaders across the region. And the Space for Earth Planet Challenge is an excellent example of just that. Today, we are fortunate to have unprecedented access to satellite remote sensing data and technologies that can help us better detect, monitor, and measure climate changes. New satellite data and wider access to computing and analysis tools are enabling researchers to develop new solutions. The prize challenge is an opportunity to catalyze just that kind of action while creating new avenues for space education and outreach and stimulating economic growth and development in this sector. So the specific challenge um, that our teams were asked to tackle um, was to use satellite data in combination with other data sources to help scientific methods that will identify target areas of methane emissions on Earth. Methane is a very strong greenhouse gas and the monitoring and control of methane emissions is a vital component of efforts to reduce and mitigate the effects of climate change. That is all to say, this is an urgent and topical challenge, and I, for one, am very excited to see what the teams have designed. Before we turn to those presentations and a, and a run of show, we're really fortunate to have a series of short remarks from some key partners and leaders um, in the field. So I'll introduce them now, and then I'll give you the run of show for the presentations that will follow. The first um, of our speakers is Honorable Judith Collins, New Zealand's Minister of Space. Minister Collins was first elected to Parliament in 2002, 
Um, she now wears many hats in government, including Minister of Defense, Minister for Science, Innovation and Technology, Minister for Digitizing Government, um, on top of looking after space. We're really excited to see where the industry goes with her leadership and are honored to have her address the challenge participants today. So we'll now hear a pre-recorded video from Minister Collins. Good evening. It is a pleasure to speak to you all and to send my warm wishes and good luck to all the competitors taking part in this challenge. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but I'm in Christchurch to mark the fifth anniversary of the horrific terrorist attacks on the Christchurch mosques and to be with the families and friends of the victims. As Minister for Space, I am acutely aware of the expanding opportunities that space presents. These include the exciting opportunities and technologies, not to mention the people working with them, that can play an important role in combating climate change. From satellites monitoring carbon emissions to remote sensing platforms tracking deforestation, space-based solutions offer unparalleled insights into our planet's climate system. Yet the importance of space technologies expands beyond observation. They support the development of innovative solutions and adaptations to the impacts of climate change. Whether it is deploying renewable energy systems, optimizing agricultural processes, or creating resilient infrastructure, the possibilities are limitless. Already we are seeing this with New Zealand's involvement in the Methane Sat project, which launched last week. And this is particularly relevant to today's challenge and a perfect example of how space-based technologies can improve our approach to helping combat climate change throughout the world. I hope you all have approached this challenge with a sense of pride and determination. Your innovations have the power to inspire change, to shape policy and to pave the way for a sustainable future. Congratulations to everyone involved. I am excited to see the results of the challenge. Terrific. Um, our next speaker is Peter Vetter, the Senior Director at Methane Sat. Uh, Methane Sat launched just last week and is a joint New Zealand US initiative to enhance methane emissions detective world, de detection worldwide. It is truly an inspiration to the specific challenge um, problem area that we're exploring today. And we're really lucky to have um, some remarks from Peter. Peter's been assisting challenge participants throughout um, through presentations and access to data and in the challenge research incubator. So we're really grateful um, to Peter and happy to now feature some pre recorded remarks from him as well. Hello, my name is Peter Vetter, and I'm the Senior Director of Mission Systems for Methane Set. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today with you for the space-based challenge finals, but hopefully by the time you are seeing this video, MethaneSat will be successfully launched and we will be busy in the middle of our commissioning operations. First, I want to thank you all for participating in this challenge this year as it focuses on a critical issue related to methane mitigation. As you all well know, methane is an important contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, and reducing methane emissions is our fastest path to reducing climate change in the near term. So the work that you've been doing, the ideas you've been developing, the things which you have been focusing on are all important to helping the global effort to cut this dangerous greenhouse gas. Methane set, now that we're in orbit, will also be collecting measurements on a global basis and providing data on a regular cadence to everybody in the world. It'll be freely accessible on our web portal. And in the future, you'll be able to apply the techniques and the ideas you've developed as part of the space based challenge with the data that we'll be delivering from Methane set. So, with that, I want to wish you all luck during the finals. Thank you again for the important work you're doing. And hopefully in the future, we'll be seeing some more of the work you're doing using the methane set data. Take care and good luck. The next speaker is someone who I am quite a big fan of actually, um, United States Ambassador to New Zealand, Tom Udall. 
Ambassador Udall has been a powerful voice for um, the environment and conservation movements, as well as Native American rights in the United States. This included several decades of public service um, in his home state of New Mexico, as well as in the U.S. Senate. He's been serving as ambassador to New Zealand and Samoa since 2021, and um, we're really lucky to now have a recorded video um, from Ambassador Udall. Tenakoto, kia ora and hello everyone. Thank you for having me join you today. I want to tell you how excited the U.S. mission to New Zealand is to work with you on the Space for Planet Earth Challenge. I'm always delighted to see young people engaging with the critical challenge the world is facing. And we are proud to support your endeavors. One of the key things I like about the Space for Planet Earth Challenge is that it engages young people in Pacific Island communities to help nations around the Pacific mitigate and adapt to climate change. That matters. And it's a goal the U.S. government is working towards on many levels. My boss, President Biden, announced that the United States would address climate challenges in the Pacific by investing over $130 million in substantial resourcing, support, and partnerships. As the U.S. Ambassador to New Zealand, one of my priorities is fighting climate change. Our embassy has supported climate initiatives through funding, dialogue, and partnerships, notably with organizations like Sea Cleaners and the United States Coast Guard. We're fostering a U.S.-New Zealand business connections in climate, energy, and clean tech, essential for environmental technology exchange and economic growth. The recent launch of Methane Sat, a joint U.S.-New Zealand space project, underscores our country's long-standing cooperation towards a better world. This year marks 150 years of U.S.-New Zealand scientific collaboration starting with the 1874 Transit of Venus observations, continuing this legacy through space exploration and climate protection honors our shared history. I'm confident that together we can make a real difference. Thank you to everyone involved in the Space for Planet Earth Challenge. Excellent. Our final speaker is Anne Ruault, um, science attache for the French Embassy in New Zealand. Anne has also played a key role in supporting the challenge this year, opening up new opportunities to partner and collaborate with Pacific Island nations. Anne has held senior roles at the University of New Caledonia um, and in the French Embassy to Australia. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to now hand over um, to Ms. Anne Ruault. Jeremy. Uh, kia ora, Emeline and, and Eric, kia ora finalists and, and dear space passionates. Um, uh, my name is Anne Rouault. I'm in charge of higher education and science at the French Embassy in New Zealand. It's an absolute uh, pleasure and excitement to be uh, here with you tonight uh, for the challenge final. Um, I'd like to pay tribute first to Emeline and Eric uh, from Space Base uh, for their amazing work in uh, framing such a, an inspiring and inclusive, uh, inclusive sorry, initiative. Uh, I'd like to stress that uh, I'm glad that the challenge has uh, led already to the establishment of uh, very productive linkages with the new uh, Caledonian geospatial community. So there was no hesitation from the French Pacific Fund in contributing to the funding of this challenge, considering its utmost importance. You all know uh, the interna international engagement of France um, in the context of uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation agenda from uh, COP21 
uh, to uh, the next uh, United Nations conference in Nice uh, next year. Over the past years, the Pacific Fund has already been empowering uh, joint efforts of innovative businesses, students, and scientists to develop and exploit geospatial solutions of Pacific relevance. This fully aligns with the objective of the uh, Taos Pacific Community Digital Earth Pacific Initiative, and this is, of course, directly serving the needs of Pacific states and territories for their environmental decision making at a critical point in time. Today's final challenge just takes place, as everybody mentioned already, a couple of days after the launch of the Medansat uh, satellite tracking mission. It's, uh, it's an obvious, uh, fantastic uh, uh, source of inspiration. Uh, new space developments now totally, as you all know, um, discloses students, scientists, taking over this creativity and offers a wide range of business opportunities that can directly address the major environmental challenges we are facing. So this makes uh, each of you today's finalists, potential designers of future global, global solutions, the floor is yours. Our curiosity and support is at its maximum. Thank you so much, Anne, um, for your remarks and your and your leadership more generally. Um, it's a real inspiring backdrop for the presentations and visions that we are about to hear. Um, as we transition to those presentations, let me um, give you a little sense for the agenda and the flow for the rest of our time together. Um, I will first be introducing the finalists for the high school category. I'll introduce one at a time. There are three, and each team will have about eight minutes to present to you all. This will be followed by the university category. And again, I'll introduce um, each team um, at a time, and they'll have eight minutes to present to you all. Because time is limited, um, we're not going to have a dedicated Q&A session following these presentations, but audience members are welcome to use the chat um, function throughout um, to, to share comments. After the six presentations, we'll take a short break, let the judges confer, and when we come back together, we'll have an opportunity to hear from the judges and we'll announce the grand prize winners. Um, and then at the end, finally, we'll have um, some time for Emmeline Pat Dahlstrom from Space Space um, to provide some closing remarks. So um, let's dive in or, or launch off might be <laughs> a more apt transition. Um, the first finalist team uh, joins us from Newham, Australia. Um, they are the Methane Mavericks and represent students from the Keaton High School and Marlboro Education Center. The speaker will be Olivia Hedge, who will pitch their idea titled Using Sentinel Data to Identify and Prioritize Small Scale Emissions for Methane Sat. I'm Olivia. I'm with my friend Kwa. We are the Methane Mavericks, high school students from Victoria, Australia, passionate about the environment and climate action. To tackle the space-based 2023 challenge, where the task was to develop tools to help identify target areas for the methane set launch in 2024, we created an AI to identify methane emitting wetlands and rank target areas based on low based on how many methane emitting wetlands they contain. According to NASA, wetlands are the source of a third of global methane emissions. Emissions from small wetlands are likely significant, but we lack accurate data due to current technological limitations. To identify target areas for small-scale methane sources of all types, we focused on accurately identifying wetland methane emissions. And while many wetlands are detectable using GHGSAT or another data set, many are small enough to go undetected. Accurate detection and tracking of these emissions is critically important as the relationship between global warming and wetland methane emissions is a positive feedback loop. We chose to focus on wetlands in our home state because methane emissions from wetlands are reliant on vegetation, season, water levels, temperature, and microbes, variables that are simplified by containing the data set to one area's climate. However, we also trained our AI with data from England, Zambia, Finland, and New Zealand to improve accuracy. Our idea outputs 200 kilometer squared areas containing the most methane emitting wetlands. And there are three stages to our solution. 
Firstly, large 200 kilometre square areas are randomly selected, and all our data is from Sentinel-2 and accessed through the Copernicus platform. Wetlands are identified with the layer moisture index as groups of pixels above a certain intensity. Every identified wetland has four images downloaded and labeled, and these types of images correspond to the level of photosynthesis, water availability, estimation of the quantity and location of heat and methane, and a satellite photograph of the wetland. In the second stage, we feed these images into our AI and it compresses them together and gives the statistical likelihood of the wetland emitting methane. If that probability is above 50%, the wetland is classified as emitting methane. And if it is below 50%, it is classified as not emitting methane. I will now show a demonstration of this aspect of our solution. Can you hear that sound? Not right now. Uh, I'm really sorry. I have to share sound. Give me one second. Um, I'm unable to share my sound along with this, which is frustrating. Sorry. Here we go. Sorry about that. This is Methane Maverick's artificial intelligence prototype demonstration. We trained the AI on 30 wetlands. 20 of these were labeled yes and emit methane, and 10 were labeled no and did not emit methane. Every one of these images is converted to 300 by 300 pixels by the AI, which is an above average resolution and improves the accuracy of the model. In the pre-processing stage, the four images are combined. This image then undergoes further pre pre-processing where each image is flipped and zoomed many times to generate more images and this reduces the chance of the AI not detecting the methane emissions due to the wetland just being oriented in a way it doesn't recognize. This process is also performed on the training data which means that while the data set contains 30 wetlands it contains closer to 300 separate images. We ran the program with four different wetlands, two are emitting methane and two do not. Of the wetlands that were tested, the AI could accurately detect 100% of the wetlands that were emitting methane. And when it came to the wetlands that were not emitting methane, only 50% were detected accurately. This makes sense, as our database did contain more yes wetlands than no wetlands. And with further development, the training data, the accuracy should improve for the no wetlands. The third stage of our solution is where we combine all the wetland data that we obtained from the AI together for each 200 kilometer square area. And then we rank each 200 kilometer square area. So firstly, we rank the areas with the most wetlands to the least. We only want the areas with the most methane emitting wetlands. And the next stage is then to rank those highest areas, the most methane emitting wetlands against each other, according to the average probability of the wetlands emitting methane or not. The wetlands that are most highly ranked after this stage of the process are the target areas areas with the most methane emitting wetlands and the highest probability of those wetlands definitely emitting methane. This solution is tailored to methane sat as the satellite scans 200 kilometer square images. This is a prototype uh, demonstration. The third stage of our solution is where the 200 kilometer by 200 kilometer square areas that we originally found wetlands from are compared and ranked to find the target areas for methane sat analysis. For this process, first the areas are ranked according to how many wetlands the AI found that are most likely emitting methane. And then the 200 kilometer square areas at the top of this list are compared to see which had the highest confidence rate, indicating greater emissions. We ran this with these three example areas here. And the program ranked them firstly according to how many methane emitting wetlands they had, and they were each allocated a rank and then the sum emissions, which is based off the confidence rate. Accurate detection of methane emissions will improve climate models and improve our understanding of the climate crisis. Knowing which wetlands are emitting methane at different times of the year means that local environmental organizations can minimize these emissions effectively. 
And furthermore, identifying wetlands that are likely to be emitting methane provides target areas for analysis with on-ground methane detection devices. We contacted Chris Pollock from Landcare, a national not-for-profit organisation that manages natural landscapes such as wetlands. She said our solution would assist in the investigation of wetlands producing abnormal amounts of methane. And she also said they could use our solution to identify wetlands for future restoration. Furthermore, they don't have the capacity to monitor methane outputs from their wetlands, a role we could fill with a calibrated solution. We will continue this in early 2025 by contacting environmental organisations and local land care groups. In late 2025, we then have the capacity to set up connections with environmental conservation groups that allow us to deploy on-ground sensors that can validate our training data. Then in early 2026, we can use our solution to find target areas of analysis for methane sat. In mid-2026, we can use the data from methane sat to further improve and adjust our training data. Then in late 2026, we would like to investigate the ability for our AI to identify methane emitting wetlands with only one true color image based off the patterns we have identified to date. And then in early 2027, we will develop our solution with a user interface and a focus on the AI capability of identifying individual methane hotspots rather than large target areas in order to better cater to individual needs and environmental organizations. To design and prototype this idea, we collaborated with South Australian company Espy Ocean, who we connected through with Spacebase. The help we received from Ian and Jill was invaluable to fully develop our solution, and they were incredibly generous with sharing resources, time, and knowledge. We also connected with people experienced with AI in other companies such as Hex Education and the AI Development Department at KPMG. Other notable other notable individuals who supported us throughout this project are Varshath Misala, who supported us with the AI encoding aspects, Harry Tarr, who provided design support, and of course, Emmeline and Eric, who provided valuable advice throughout the entire project. Our team is just Kwa and I, but between us, we have excellent presentation, pitching, design, and networking skills that enabled us to execute this project. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Olivia. That was wonderful. Um, next up is the Kashmir Space Club, um, representing students from Kashmir High School in Christchurch, New Zealand. Their speaker will be Cairo Ackerhurst. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Please correct me if I'm not. Um, who will pitch their, their idea titled Profitable Way for Farmers to Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emissions, Assisting New Zealand to Report GHG Inventories to the IPCC. Over to you, Cairo. Give me control. Yeah. Thanks for the intro, Amy. I'm Cairo from the Kashmir Space Club here in Christchurch, New Zealand. And this is Joe. He's a beef farmer. And this is his friend, McDonald. He's another beef farmer, but he's a bit angry. Ever since they realized how much methane that their cows are emitting, they tried to reduce it. But the government also agrees. And in 2008, they, emit, they put in the emissions trading scheme which makes every farmer have to pay for the amount of methane that their cows emit. Now, we can't measure it. Like many people within the industry said, if you can't measure it, you can't reduce it. But the farmers are still going to have to pay. So, but we don't know how much they're producing. So blanket factors are going to get used. The figure says that each cow produces around 100 kg of methane per year, but McDonald feeds his cows methane inhibitors. So they only actually produce 75 kgs per year. Well, he still gets, has to charge the same amount as Joe. So we need to measure it. Our solution is a profitable way for farmers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. By making it a business, it's scalable and can be exported globally around the world to have a global impact. To do this, we need a team. You can do anything if you build a good team. We're using MethaneSat data, which actually just launched last week and we realized that it's actually impossible to see the diffuse methane that comes from these cows. So we decided to look into how methane set works, and we found four ways that work together to make it possible to quantify the amount of methane that these cows produce using methane set technology. To make this data higher resolution, we're rotating, rotating the satellite to decrease the swath width and increase the resolution. Also, backscanning to shorten the pixel length and the methane sat science team at Harvard University said that this, this can increase the resolution by up to three times. 
With the standard public data, you get about two to three data points for the average 400 cow farm. With our system, we can give 510 pixels. This innovative integration of space technology to measure methane emissions at a farm level is novel to us. We've come up with an innovative solution due to our philosophical approach to look at the sensor from first principles and look to exploit any opportunities that arise in the design and operations of MethaneSat. But what we're doing is very difficult. So our approach is to use peer-reviewed scientific papers to address the individual challenges. We've used for this challenge 28 scientific papers referenced in the back of our original proposal. And what, one part of our solution is actually novel and new, and this is the skewing maneuver. Basically, it's a rotating the satellite, say 45 degrees for the way it's traveling. So this, what this does is increases the resolution. This is a regular thing that Methansat does where it rotates itself. It does this for tasking maneuvers like downlinking data, which makes skewing totally feasible. The technical feasibility and rigor of this system is fully backed on sound science. One of the fundamental problems with backtracing is accurately knowing how McDonald's farm is going to get methane is going to get blown over to Joe's farm. As one of the judges highlighted, McDonald may actually have a landfill next to Joe's farm, which means we need to backtrace to two separate sources that are side by side. To overcome this, we use very simply cheap with each farm to track the wind. This way, we get very accurate local wind velocity and direction data that can then be used in back tracing to get the two side-by-side -side sources who, so we actually know whose methane is whose. By using on-site local weather stations, we can backtrace to individual farms and landfills, and we can also creatively integrate the research from backtracing par particles drifting through the oceans, and this is quite similar to how methane drifts through the air. We're particularly proud of this one though, and this is to provide the service to farm management software providers by increasing the accuracy of the product they provide to their customers, and also providing a service to the government with, measure, with measurable and reportable greenhouse gas emissions. Well, from the farmer's point of view, it's a seamless integration into their existing farm management software. They don't even notice anything happens. So what they actually, when they go to generate a greenhouse gas report, they, the, our satellite measured data will come in and they'll be pleasantly surprised that all the carbon emissions that they have could be offset by the amounts of carbon sequestration that happens on their farm. Using Overseer, we can get access to their 15,000 plus farms in New Zealand alone. And this is without a nationwide sales team. The environmental impact of this solution is huge. Being part of a large movement towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we can rapidly impact the way agriculture operates around the world since you can't reduce it if you can't measure it. We're measuring it so they can reduce it. Being a, being a business solution, the evidence of impact will be standard business KPIs. The business performance will show the demand for data usage, allowing us to see how accurate our reporting is being applied. Also, the government's reporting to the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. As part of building up a good team, we collaborated with experts from multiple fields this being Lincoln University and their Ashley Dean Research Farm, our school, the New Zealand Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, Bank of New Zealand, the Ministry for Primary Industries, the University of Canterbury and Lincoln University. We do have an ask of you too, every one of you watching. If you think you can help us make this happen, please contact us through the organisers because we are dead keen on developing this solution further. Thanks. Thank you, Cairo. I, I imagine you're going to have a lot of people reaching out. That was that was terrific. Um, our final high school presentation is from the Uzbangmi team. They represent students from the University of Philippines High School in Iloilo, Philippines. Their speaker will be Krizia Gaikayan, who will be presenting their pitch, which is titled Integrating Satellite Data for Aerial Surveillance, Simulating Drone Sensor Synergy in Mapping and Quantifying Subtle Methane Emissions in Rice Paddies. Over to you, Crisia. Oh. 
Nicola soy Krisha, but seriously, mabuhay. I am Krisha Gakaya, the team lead of us, Bongmi. You may be wondering why I impersonated Dora. Well, that's because just like Dora, our team are aspiring students who aim to explore not only science, but the world. I'd like to invite you to picture yourself in the world where I grew up, in the typical community with rice fields in the Philippines. So picture this, it's 5 a.m. in the morning, the sun isn't even up yet, but you will see a farmer already up and about in the fields, probably holding his morning mug of coffee as he takes the morning scene breathing deeply. But the air might not be as pure as he thought it would be. Why? Because the particles in the air that the farmer inhales might be mixed with a type of odorless, colorless, and flammable greenhouse gas methane. He doesn't know this, but of course we do. Over the last few decades, there have been many studies that showed how rice paddies, a field that provides food for our table and livelihood to our farmers, are actually a source of methane emissions. But don't you worry, we already have the technology where we can look for these methane emissions and show us how much of these are present in the world. So how? Does the word satellite ring a bell? These are instruments that we've launched today in space, and one of their jobs is to find and measure greenhouse gases. These satellites are so modern, so powerful, yet they can't detect the minor and subtle ones. However, subtle emissions don't mean that they are small problems. This is where my team, Usbong Mi, comes in. By the way, the term Usbong comes from the indigenous people of our island in Panay to mean emission. Usually, any gases emitted underground, so we are inspired about these emissions because they seem so natural and extraordinary, but their effect is really profound in our ecosystems. We want to bridge the gap between what the satellite gives and what the ground-based data actually sees by incorporating satellite data with ground-based and aerial data to identify specific sources of methane emissions. In this case, we didn't have to go very far since rice paddies are literally just in our backyards and they are abundant in the Philippines because it is an agricultural country. How did we do this? Now, there have been many several steps along the way. First, as we calibrated ground-based sensor, the Arduino and the MQ4 sensor before deployment. Next, we designed two devices, a chamber and an aerial methane detector. For data collection, we use an Arduino-based sensor connected with an MQ4 sensor to find if methane is actually present in the area. Then, with these devices, we are able to collect three types of data. First is the ground base on chambers. Third, second is the aerial on aerial methane de detector. Third is the methane data from the satellites. After data validation, we integrated our data from ground base and aerial sensors with data from the satellites to check and calibrate the satellite data. And after both satellite and ground data have been calibrated and verified, we analyze and discuss the results of the data for our team to have a better understanding about detecting methane emissions. Now, how does our solution differ from the other solutions? Well, we are just ordinary but curious students from a third world country. So we made sure that the materials used are low cost and accessible. We made sure that the designs can be substituted with other low cost materials. Two, we developed an Arduino based device to, de to detect minor methane emissions. And we used this to operate the MQ4, which is a key to making this possible. We used to only learn about Arduino technology in our lessons, but now we actually have the chance to use it in research. Third, our methods can be conducted independently, which is very important for local farmers and other researchers. They may be agricultural researchers and even us, and whoever has the basic skills about this can execute this research. How exactly did we make our prototype? Ladies and gentlemen, rising up like the emissions in our study, we introduce to you the Ospung app. Our team designed and developed an app that includes the data we've gathered from the ground-based sensors, as well as the open access data from the satellites. Both of these were built into the app to enable the cross-referencing of the data from both maps. So you, one of our potential users, are able to correlate and compare the data 
through the application. With our Usbong app, project, we wanted to provide accurate ground-based methane data sensors with the use of Arduino devices, MQ4 sensors, chambers, and the aerial devices. And we want to enhance the accuracy of methane data for satellites. We have immersed ourselves in the world of agriculture researchers, and we have seen the agricultural technicians do their work, and we have understood the daily realities of our farmers. And so we believe that our Usbong app can aid agricultural personnel, academic and research institutions, and the environmental agencies and NGOs by providing them with information, validated and accurate methane data, which will enable them to further improve space technology as well as agricultural technology and techniques that are shared to our farmers underground, the very ones who provide food for our table. They say it takes a village to teach a child. But for us, it takes more than that to teach an ordinary students how to research and do innovation. This project wouldn't be possible without the help and collaboration of multiple stakeholders. UPHSI, the University of the Philippines High School in Iloilo, which provided the facilities and technical guidance and support throughout this journey. West VARC, the Western Visayas Integrated Agricultural Research Center of the Department of Agriculture, Region 6, who not only allowed us to conduct our fieldwork and on-site implementation, but also provided us with additional insights. And of course, space base for the super focus and encouraging guidance and support. So, what did we produce? We combined ground-based data collected through Arduinos, chambers, and aerial devices, and sensors. We wanted to use this data to enhance and invalidate the methane data from satellites by using the ground-based and drone-based data to calibrate the satellite readings. This will help pinpoint and mitigate methane emissions in the rice paddies for lesser greenhouse gas emissions and better crop quality through the Usbong application. So in the end, what did we learn? Doing science is fun, but is it, also, it is also messy. You don't always get it in just one go. We learn about our community, and we also learn about ourselves. You just have to be patient, just like that farmer, who's serving his rice field in the morning, securing his knowledge that his small livelihood has a big impact on the lives of our community. Thank you, that is all. Thank you so much, Crazy, and I love the uh, personal reflections on learning from the process as well. That was terrific. Um, and thank you to all of our high school participants. That was our third and final um, high school presentation. Um, I hope that you're all applauding wherever you are in the world. That was terrific. I know that the judges are going to have a really hard time um, ahead of them. Um, we are now going to turn to the university category. Um, our first team is the Interplanetary Exploration Institute representing Macquarie University from Sydney, Australia. Uh, their speaker is James Bevington, who's going to present their pitch, which is titled Methane Fingerprinting with Laser Heterodon Radiometry. I hope I got that right, James. Um, over to you. Is that clear? I'll assume it is. Yep. Hi, I'm Jay Bevington, yep. the uh, founder of the Interplanetary Exploration Institute, and this is our submission in partnership with Macquarie University. Oops. There we go. Um, so I'd like to start today by asking if you can tell what season is depicted in this photograph. In black and white, it isn't immediately clear, but when you add color, it becomes much more obvious that this is fall. What our team is doing is we're bringing color to the problem of methane detection. The energy sector and the agricultural sector are responsible for roughly the same amount of emissions, but these two sectors are not making the same progress towards reducing those emissions. In the energy sector, emissions are largely regulated in most countries and they're enabled by measurement capability. So historically, they used conversion factors, for example, assuming a certain leak rate per kilometer of pipeline. But recently, they've been making actual measurements using satellites, which have revealed that those conversion factors were underreporting by about 60%. Motivated by profits, companies are taking action to keep methane in the pipeline rather than in the atmosphere, because that's a product they can turn around and sell for more money. That's a positive market incentive. By contrast, in agriculture, 
Emissions are largely unregulated, and recent proposals have been met with fierce opposition. Farmers have been driving tractors and livestock into capital cities across Europe and New Zealand, creating chaos. And the reason is because they lack measurement capability. Most of these proposals rely on those old conversion factors, which in agriculture mostly means livestock weight. So to reduce methane emissions ultimately means to reduce the product they're trying to sell. That's a negative market incentive. It's no surprise then when we look at the Australian carbon credit system, only three farms have actually generated carbon credits in that system since the beginning in 2015. So what we need to break the impasse is a measurement capability that enables positive market site incentives in agriculture. Now, agricultural methane is particularly difficult to measure because it arises in aggregate from thousands of farms spread across continents. And in between these farms, we have other non-agricultural sources adding to the confusion. So it's really difficult for any one farm to know what emissions it's responsible for from its own activities. So we're fingerprinting methane by using additional information about uh, heavy molecules, which are specific to the source that generated that methane and independent of the emission source's location. When Bisous et al. 2022 used this type of measurement about heavy carbon from 45 sites across the world, they were better able to distinguish between fossil fuel and microbial derived methane, uh, which is mostly from agriculture. We aim to increase the amount of measurements from 45 to global maps to add more types, more data for these types of analyses. To do that, we're building a laser heterodyne radiometer or LHR. The strength of this system is that it converts an optical signal into a radio signal, at which point we can use decades of technology and best practice to better process and refine the signal. A specific interest is the, the ability to amplify or amplification. In optics, that's really difficult, but in radio, it's, it's almost trivial. And that's what's gonna allow us to see really faint signals. Now, as part of our submission, we have two components. In the first case, we've done a simulation where we created a digital scene with two point sources emitting methane. And then we flew a spacecraft over um, to try to simulate what we expect that spacecraft would see. The, in one case, the two point sources were from the same source type, but in the second case, they were from two different source types. When we look at the main methane feature that most satellites can see, potentially all satellites can see, what we, what we see is that they're all able to see two point sources, but it isn't immediately clear what the source type is. It isn't even clear that in the top row, it's a different source type, and in the bottom, it's the same source type. So GHG sat and methane sat would use additional information, for example, looking to see what kind of uh, infrastructure is there. Uh, as a way of ascribing the source type. But when we add additional information about heavy molecules, it becomes immediately clear what the source type is. And it was different in the top row and the same in the bottom row. And this is what I mean when I say we're bringing color to methane detection. The second part of our submission is that we've built a benchtop model to verify that this sensor does indeed work in the lab space. We've replaced the sun with a superluminescent diode, and we've replaced the atmosphere with a gas cell that allows us to tweak and change and control exactly what we're measuring. And here's an example measurement on the left. And what we see in black is a theoretical model based on the known amount of methane that we put into the gas cell. In blue, we've confirmed that that's what's actually there with a the laser. And then in orange, we see the measurement that we made with our sensor. And so this confirms that we're actually measuring what we think that we're measuring in the lab. I'll also point out that on the right, uh, we've got uh, the main methane feature that all satellites can see. And on the left, we have the carbon-13 or the heavy carbon. Um, that's the, the new information. Moving forward, uh, we have a pathway, a project plan to uh, reach space in three years, but make uh, impact on a much shorter time scale. Um, so we intend to build a benchtop model uh, that'll be the actual sensor, so we'll keep refining what we have. And then we're going to use that in the field and on an airborne platform uh, with farmers and environmental scientists that we've already been speaking with. 
Uh, we'll use that basically to develop and test the market. And then we'll build a version that will fly on a small satellite uh, with sort of lower level performance characteristics that'll allow us to one test, but two actually start delivering data uh, for a subset of users that need that can use the lower performance data. And then in the future, we'll build a more sophisticated system. So our team has the capability to deliver this payload. Uh, we've previously flown collectively eight payloads. Um, so we know what it takes to go from a benchtop model uh, to a space payload. Our expertise spans the entire problem set. We've also got access to collaborators and advisors at Macquarie University, the University of New South Wales, and through our extensive networks. Finally, I'd just like to say that at the Interplanetary Exploration Institute, we strongly support agriculture, the environment, and the planet, and we look forward to building the future that we know is possible. Thank you. Fabulous, inspiring. Thank you so much, James, and your colleagues. Um, the next team is Project AIM. Um, they are joining us from Metro Manila and represent a collaboration of students from a variety of universities, Rizal Technolo Technological University, Adamson University, and Caraga State University. Um, the speaker will be Johan Mai Obras uh, pitching their project, which is titled Assessing Methane Information for Mapping Rice Paddies in the Philippines. Over to you. Okay, now more than ever, we need data to address methane. I am Johan May Obras, part of the Project AIM, and we are ready to commit the Global Methane Pledge in reducing methane emissions at least 30%. Why opt for rice paddies for monitoring methane emissions? Based on St Stephen Harbert, a methane real researcher, we knew the data were not very good. So we couldn't reduce emissions if we do not know where they are coming from. So unlike carbon that stays in the atmosphere for almost a century, methane emissions are more manageable because it stays only a decade. The numbers don't lie. 90% of the global rice production comes from Asia. 4.81 million hectares are the pH agricultural land. And based on the study of Jiahu in 2022, 74.8% of methane emissions comes from agriculture in the Philippines. And they flag the rice cultivation as area of interest. Now, what does project aim for? We have three point objectives. First, to map and to estimate using space technology and IoT. Second, we offer a novel approach to gather methane emissions using satellite and observed data. Third, we help address the scarcity when it comes to methane emissions. So what is unique about the Project AIM solution? First, we have our focus target. We specifically pinpoint the rice cultivation. Second, we have integration of data. We use the observed data of the Internet of Things, satellite data, and climate variables. Third, when it comes to scalability, Project AIM promises an easily replicable program and device that can be adapted for local conditions and other rice-producing countries. In fact, our device uses readily available in the market and, of course, cost-effective. Oh, and uh, the project aim will not be possible without the coordination of the of different organizations, Star Lab, Space Base, and especially the Gimba rice farmers. So how will project aims prototype monitor methane emission? Simply, how can we do it? How can we monitor methane emissions? First, there are existing rice farms in the rice capital of the Philippines, Nueva Ecija. There are open source data for different satellite imagery. Specifically, we choose Sentinel-1. Our mapping team locates the rice paddies through mapping. And of course, once we pinpoint the rice paddies, we make sure that we deploy the Internet of Things low-cost static gas chambers. So using space technology, we use satellite data from Sentinel-1 and 2. Landsat 8, and Aerofy for climate variables. And then the field data observed from methane data of the IoT will undergo geospatial analysis. The launch of methane sat and its methane data will further enhance our model. 
So how do we get the field data? Simply because the power of Internet of Things. Our IoT team proposed the integration of observed data for enhanced replicability. Its cost effectiveness and accessibility make it a valuable asset in the methane data activation. First, they design and program the device. The testing and calibration of the device was done on a laboratory environment. The IoT device was then deployed to Gimba Nueva Ecija for continuous, continuous monitoring of methane rice paddies. And here is the flowchart of how we do the prototype. Pretty overwhelming. But then what we did is to put all of those data in one platform, a single user interface to monitor weak rice methane emissions. This is where we can provide all those data in one place. The impact. We make sure that we have contributed to monitoring and improve practices and environment. When it comes to local government units, they have access to the valuable data on methane emissions and contribute for responsible agricultural management. And for the farmers, real-time monitoring and potential for increased efficiency. Low methane emissions for rice is, means a higher crop yield. So the data used in the project lead us to the following conclusions. A sustainable future for methane reduction. So the annotated maps resulted in 49 rice paddies and 17 non-rice paddies in Gimba. The map made use of satellite data. This means that 3.94% of the land area of Gimba are rice paddies. Out of the three machine learning models, we also identify the CART method that have highest accuracy percentage with 85%. Therefore, what this all graphs and data means, the monthly methane emission declines in September to October. This graph shows the relationship between methane emission and backscatter. It simply means that the continuous flooding of the rice paddies during the interval leads to higher methane emissions. We are now presenting the project aim roadmap and how can we further improve the project. We, this is the part of the three-year plan of the project aim. And we have produced a timeline or goals so that in 2023, we now pitch the idea of project aim. We had achieved the maps, model, and deployment of the IoT. 2024 is a promise of deploying more static gas chamber that will further improve the model. In 2025, we plan to launch an open source methane date watch website where all the gathered data will be stored. The year 2026 is a promise of project aim to further support the sustainable practices with methane monitoring technology. From our IoT device, satellite data to the web and especially to the farmers and project aim team is composed of three promising sub teams from the different universities of the philippines the mapping team iot team and the technical team and with that project aim is indeed assessing methane information believing that tracking methane is changing the game thank you <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much, Joanna, and, the, and all of your, your colleagues. Um, that was a terrific. I'm seeing all of the happy um, um, reactions here, too. Thanks so much. Um, the final, universe, final team from the university category is going to join us now from the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. Uh, the speaker is Christian Delgado Fajardo, and he'll be presenting the pitch, which is titled Satellite-Based AI Emulators for Efficient Monitoring of Agricultural methane emissions in New Zealand. Over to you, Christian. Thank you so much, Amy, for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Chris, and I'm a PhD student uh, working at the University of Otago in New Zealand with Dr. Peter Wigan, Dr. Pascal Sergey, and Dr. Grant Dick, trying to integrate different uh, technologies like satellite remote sensing, artificial intelligence, and special modeling to assess uh, methane emissions from agriculture. That is one of the main sources and the tricky ones to detect from satellites. So to do so, we are taking advantage of the new generation satellites like Sentinel-5 that provides 
uh, that monitors the entire air globally uh, at higher spatial resolution and short revisit times. So one of the products that the Sentinel-5 is producing is methane concentrations uh, daily. However, using these uh, satellites, they have their own challenges. For instance, satellites measure uh, concentration, the volumetric concentration in the atmosphere rather than fluxes. And this is key to understand because the fluxes is where the sources are coming from. But the concentrations can be affected by different environmental problems like the background levels. For instance, they can measure historical or global patterns instead of where and what is the magnitude of a certain source, as well is, uh, is affected by the move of the air in the atmosphere. That's why we are using atmospheric transfer model. This is a physical chemical model that simulates a known distribution using wind patterns in different layers of the atmosphere until get a simulated concentration. After that, the simulated concentration is then compared with real observation from the satellite the error is back propagated until we get a posterior emission that is much better than the initial estimation. However, this uh, kind of models requires considerable time, uh, up to some days or even weeks, and high computational cost to run. This is needed high throughput, high throughput computing to, to run these kind of models. That's why we are aiming to produce faster AI models uh, training from existing slower and more computationally demanding physical models. So we are using simulations to train the AI models. And here is the approach. So we have started with a data set uh, with, deployed by CAMS uh, from the Copernicus program. This is a, a course resolution model with a spatial resolution of 500 kilometers. It provides monthly emissions and daily concentrations. So we train a model using that data. And after that, we transfer that model with high resolution or with medium resolution data set that we develop using the IMI framework provided by the University of Harvard. So uh, after that, we build a user interface that allows the user to draw region of interest and define a time frame. Uh, this, uh, they, these parameters go to Google Earth Engine to search for the data catalog. And this data is going to the eighth platform. The predictions are retrieved and we deploy the predictions into the web interface. So now I'm gonna jump to do the demonstration of how our prototype is working. So this is our prototype. Here we can define a, a time frame. And we can draw, for instance, a region of interest in New Zealand. After we draw the region of interest, uh, we started receiving some uh, the predictions as well as some ancillary data that could be useful for to research around what are the drivers that are influencing in a certain methane profile. So some of the ancillary data is the soil moisture derived from Sentinel-1, land cover derived from Sentinel-2, as well as the uh, Sentinel-5 data and emissions, uh, sorry, the velocity field will, uh, wind fields from ERA-5. So we think that just by doing that, it could be really useful for policymakers or for the governments to monitor uh, or to verify their inventories, especially in, in developing countries like South America or Colombia that they don't have the ability to do it. At the same time, uh, we can search for a specific region here. For instance, I'm gonna look for Omaru. That is a place in which I know one of my friends has a big farm. So we can see if we activate the time series tool, where is the, how is the profile through the time? So we can see here how in winter we have lower emissions than in, in summer. After that, uh, this tool could be really useful for farmers, for instance, if they are doing some, uh, running some mitigation efforts, how they can quantify this visually. So here in the left, we have, for instance, an image of winter compared with the, with the image uh, in the right side that is summer. So we see how we have more emissions in summer than in winter. 
Uh, also, uh, we think that this could be useful for policymakers in order to extract uh, statistics from different regions. This could be different regions in New Zealand, or even we can go lower to see municipalities or the smallest areas, or even though draw some region of interest and get a bunch of statistics like mean, the standard deviation, or even though the aggregation value. So after we downloaded that, we can see a table in which just we can quantify per region what is the amount of methane. And we hope that this could be really useful for policymakers. Here, for instance, we see that the biggest, biggest uh, regions in terms of uh, livestock producing uh, are the are the top here. So after that, we think about validation, how to validate our, our approaches. So we wrote a project to the Global Methane Hub and we get funding to buy basically high technology sensor that allow us to measure methane, methane emissions, methane fluxes in different, in different uh, countries. So this project is about 48 months and we are gonna run an extensive field campaign to take data in, in four different regions, including the USA, uh, Peru, Uruguay, and Panama. We are having a strong collaboration with the USDA Department of Agriculture to uh, validate these approaches. And here I'm gonna show some demo of how the data looks like. So here we have the 46 samples that we collected last month in Arkansas, that is the biggest region, uh, the, the biggest rice region in, in, in the US. And we can see the different data points. And we believe that all these data can be used for validation. It's gonna be freely available. So. For instance, the people from Meta Insight can be take advantage of this um, data to validate their estimations. Finally, I would like to pinpoint what is the future plan. First of all, we are gonna guarantee the quality of data sets. So we establish collaboration with NIWA to, to improve the data set. We are gonna validate the emission using ground truth data. And after that, we are gonna deploy this in Google because Google is supporting this initiative. Finally, I would like to thank all the partners involved in this initiative and invite any of the audience if they want to join us. Thank you so much. Terrific, thank you so much, Chris. And I think you also will be getting some, um, some outreach. Um, what a terrific showcase of innovation. And um, I think importantly, also collaboration. Um, so many of you have been working across institutions and across sectors in the development of these pitches and it really shows. Um, so kudos to everyone. Um, thank you for all the hard work coming to this point and for, for um, bringing your full selves to this um, um, presentation. Uh, it was just absolutely wonderful. Um, I am now really happy to give everyone a short 15 minute break while the judges confer. Um, so we'll be coming back at uh, 6.55 New Zealand time, so adjust to whatever your time zone is. Um, I'm going to go give my son a quick hug before bedtime, and you do whatever you need to do, and we'll give the judges some time. Um, we'll see you back at 6.55. Thank you so much. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I don't envy the judges at all. <laughs> I think they took a little extra time, and I don't blame them. Those pitches really reflected exceptional work. Um, so uh, just congratulations again to everyone. Um, as a reminder, in addition to the honor of being recognized, 
The grand prize winner from the university startup category will receive $25,000 and six months of mentorship with the amazing space-based team. And the high school grand prize winner will receive $8,000. And all finalists in the university startup category will receive $2,500. And all finalists in the high school category will receive $1,000. So everyone is really being recognized for the amazing work they've put into this. And I think as many finalists indicated, um, these teams are really sure. open to partnership um, from this community. So I hope you all take them up on that um, invitation and who knows where all those connections might lead. So um, really happy to introduce the award announcer for the high school level grand prize, who is Dimitri um, Geidelberg from the New Zealand Space Agency. Uh, the New Zealand Space Agency and MB have been supporters of the challenge competitions since 2018. Um, Dimitri, who is the acting team lead for Space Regulatory System, gets to carry on that tradition um, this evening and happy to turn it over to you, to Dimitri. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. Um, good, good evening. Uh, bonsoir tous. Um, thank you very much. I'm really honoured to be here uh, presenting on behalf of the uh, of the judges for the high school uh, category. Um, I, I really appreciate um, Space Base uh, inviting me here, and, and I acknowledge um, all the teams, uh, the um, you know my fellow judges, and everyone uh, involved in, in in making this this event happen. So so thank you. Uh, in, um, in in late uh, 2018, um, I travelled with the uh, the then head of the New Zealand Space Agency uh, to meet with um, the the team, the science team at, at Environmental Defence Fund, to talk about a possible partnership uh, between EDF and uh, the New Zealand government in the methane fat mission. Uh, so you know, fast forward uh, a, a few years later, I was really delighted uh, to be at Rocket Lab Mission Control. Uh, and, and sort of held my breath and shed a little bit louder as uh, as the um, as the as the wrong rocket was on the screen, but uh, but uh, launched uh, methane sat um, into space. Uh, but of course, while that um, you know that that has taken a bit a, a bit of time, um, the science program uh, has already been underway, including with the the methane air campaign, and of course the New Zealand science team working on agricultural methane emissions has has been in place and working for over two years now. Um, I mean, I also do want to acknowledge um, that, you know, there are, um, you know, methane status is the latest in a number of uh, methane remote sensing instruments that are that are flying in space. Um, you know, we uh, have heard tonight around um, you know, the, the Sentinels and, um, and of course, uh, GHGSAT amongst other missions that have already been flying. Uh, so it's a great time. It's a really, uh, it's a really uh, timely competition um, and a great topic for this, uh, for this uh, challenge. Uh, so um, I, I want to say that the judge's job was very, very, very hard. Um, uh, you know, we were uh, really impressed uh, by the quality, by the sophistication um, of the presentations, of the concepts, um, you know, of the work that went into the um, into into really everyone's uh, and all the finalists. Uh, and, and of course, certainly in, in, in regard to the high school teams. Uh, so congratulations to, to all three teams for, for making it this far and, and really blown us away. Uh, just a few, a few quick observations. Um, for Usbang Mi, um, you know, we really were impressed with the kind of locally relevant principles that you've applied around low cost and accessible solutions. Uh, uh, what 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 wasn't in the in the presentation that this last presentation, but but was in the in the pitch to the judges earlier, um, was really how uh, you you pivoted uh, towards from a from a um, a drone which was you know was a bit underpowered to be able to carry the the sensor uh, towards the, an impromptu system of of um, you know simulating a, a drone flying um, around the um, around the area that you were you're measuring the methane emissions. Um, and of course, it had very um, a really solid uh, set of partnerships uh, backing uh, backing it up with you know with the research institutions. Um, yeah, you know, from the, the the team from from Kashmir High School. Um, I mean, really, um, you know, we were impressed about how you you looked at the market uh, opportunity, particularly in the context of the emissions trading scheme in New Zealand. Um, you know, you 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 really looked into what were the the you know you, you chose quite a hard problem um you know taking an instrument which has really been 
kind of optimized uh, for looking at sort of regional scale emissions and how do you try to get it to, to focus on farm scale emissions in a, in a pastoral system where the, the, the emissions are quite diffuse. Uh, and, you know, looking at what are the what are kind of techniques that can, can improve the resolution of those acquisitions, it was really interesting to see. Uh, similarly, that very seamless integration uh, into an existing app, or like a really well-used um, kind of market-leading app, um, again, was really impressive in terms of your sort of implementation pathway and, and of course, a really good uh, a good set of partnerships. Um, so look, it was a it was a really really hard uh, a hard decision. Um, in the end, um, the judges um, decided to award uh, Methane Mavericks uh, the prize in the high school competition. Um, you you had a very um, an elegant and compelling uh, solution. Um, you know we were convinced uh, by the uh, really achievable uh, pathway, the development pathway that you had set out. Uh, for the product and and you know the really innovative approach of bringing together you know the the different sets of sentinel data um, and you know, to identify the um, the wetlands and emitting emitting wetlands um, and and of course you know you, you you then sort of targeted using targets that aligned with the swap of of methane set again uh, like other teams really good set of partnerships and, and and you know working at the local level so so look um, great. Um, yeah, as I say, very, very hard. Uh, you know, you, you you just edged out in our opinion. So congratulations and well done. Thank you so much. We are so honored. And I really just want to thank everyone who helped us with this solution. Like along the way, Eveline, Emmeline and Eric um, and people we worked with like Varsheth and all the organizations, we could never have done it without you. I've learned so much through this opportunity and it's really inspired me to work in this area more and think about the potential for AI and satellite data in all aspects of problem solving. So thank you so much. We're honored. And also congratulations to all the other finalists. Your solutions were inspiring and incredible and we all deserved it. So thank you. Congratulations, Methane Mavericks um, and, and to all the teams. Um, that's just just wonderful. Um, I am now happy to turn it over to the award announcer for the university startup um, grand prize winner, who is Elise Allender. Uh, Elise is the planetary scientist and assistant director on national space capability technology and programs at the Australian Space Agency. Um, and like the New Zealand Space Agency, the Australian Space Agency has also been a big supporter of the challenge this year um, and really happy to um, hand, hand it over to you, Elise. Thanks, Amy. Um, thanks again to Space Base, Emmeline and Eric for allowing me the honor of announcing the winner for the uh, University and Startup Prize. Um, the projects the judges had the opportunity to evaluate in this category really showcase the breadth of international talent that we have emerging from each of our space ecosystems. Um, and I'd also like to extend my uh, congratulations to all the competitors for their fantastic submissions. They were all really, really strong. Um, all of them really highlighted the importance of space data and space technology in addressing global issues like climate change. And all the competitors aim to deliver national benefits with respect to characterizing methane emissions and throughout their design of space relevant solutions. So I really feel that space makes us think bigger and challenges us to solve problems in innovative ways by taking data and technology further, uh, developing our knowledge of science, technology and engineering and maths and how they can be applied from space to earth based applications to produce benefits that improve our daily lives. So without further ado, I'll present the award. Um, as Dimitri mentioned uh, in the high school category, uh, the judges found this really competitive. Um, so University of Otago, the judges found that you um, really had a solution that would be useful to a wide range of people, uh, including farmers, researchers, and policymakers. So your solution could be applied very widely. And you really demonstrated an advanced prototype with a validation aspect that was in progress as well. Um, IXI Institute uh, and Macquarie University, you had a very strong scientific uh, idea with, uh, with a lot of research depth, provided valuable information for industrial and agricultural sectors in terms of monitoring sources, which would be really useful for policy development. You presented a novel technique 
which would distinguish sources of methane and also add a new data set to the mix that will be valuable for understanding emissions on a global scale. And Project AIM, you had a really interesting IoT project with very strong local stakeholder collaboration, especially via Field Advice, and strong plans to encourage buy-in from the farming community as well. We found your solution very scalable for monitoring methane emissions, and that would also support sustainable farming practices. So uh, without further ado, uh, there was a tiebreaker actually for first place, that's how close it was. Um, and so the winner of this section is the University of Otago. So congratulations to all involved. Thank you. Thank you so much for the award. We are very pleased to, I'm very glad to receive this award and congratulations to all the competitors. And yeah, you can make sure that we will use uh, the award to fight climate change. Thank you. Congratulations, Chris and your team. Um, yes, I agree. Such amazing applicability relatively quickly for so many sectors and just um, wonderful solutions. So thank you. Um, thank you to everyone. <laughs> um, mostly thank you to uh, Space Base. Um, you know, they are the brainchild um, behind the Space for Planet Earth challenge. Um, space Base is a social enterprise focused on catalyzing entrepreneurial space ecosystems in emerging and developing countries, starting in New Zealand. Um, so founded by Emmeline and Eric from the US um, about six years ago, um, they've been working on growing the space industry in New Zealand, and you can really see their impact woven across New Zealand's growing space industry and ecosystem. Um, and I know how much um, they've both poured into this challenge and every challenge that um, Space Space has run. So it's it's really an honor to hand it over um, to Emmeline for um, some acknowledgements and closing remarks. Yeah, well, thanks so much, uh, Amy, again, first of all. Um, and then also, first, congratulations to everybody, both the grand uh, challenge winners and also the finalists, because all of you are actually winners. Uh, uh, for uh, one way or the other, you all get uh, prizes uh, for actually being in the finals. Um, so uh, again, this is really, really amazing for us to see just like listening to the presentations. Uh, it's just mind blowing um, in terms of like the innovation uh, that young uh, professionals and young students are, are, are doing today. So it's really fantastic. Um, we look forward to kind of like where that the research that has been done here and for the next steps, because like the challenge is just like the catalyst. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that could happen uh, just because of challenges. And, and that's kind of like the reason why we keep doing this. Um, but this particular thing is really an acknowledgement. And I just want uh, to acknowledge like everybody uh, that has sort of like helped us um, make this particular challenge um, happen. And so uh, we thank our sponsors for which uh, without them, you know, this program would not have been possible. So, you know, the Pacific Fund, uh, uh, K1W1, Orbica, Amazon Web Services, New Zealand Space Agency and MB, US Embassy, the Australian Space Agency, Biome Trust, Rich Bodo via the Griff Trust, Callahan Innovation, Auckland Space Institute, Auckland Unlimited, Auckland Airspace, Outset Ventures for all the generous support that uh, has been given us. Uh, and then also to our partners. Um, so our partners are the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, uh, Government of New Caledonia under uh, Mr. Muliava, uh, the Philippine Space Agency, uh, CCISM, La French Tech, uh, Ethical Engineering Dreams, Space Without Borders, Lincoln University, and Arose. We also want to thank the speakers, mentors, and advisors who help us during this, this like three month period. So before these finals, we actually run uh, a research incubator online between October to February, um, which then had like about 20 different sessions. Uh, we had, I wanted to also uh, thank the judges. So we had phase one and phase two judges besides our judges kind of like today. Uh, which sort of like helped us down select the 20 teams that went into the incubator. And then of course the six finalists uh, that you kind of like listened to uh, today. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we want to thank the applicants uh, and the teams that went uh, on this journey with us. Uh, we hope that uh, this is just the beginning and that we look forward to collaborating with you uh, as well um, in, in the future. Um, and then um, Eric, you wanna say something? Well, I just am really impressed that that uh, all these different teams 
have listened not only to the scientists to, to tell them that methane is an important problem, but used all the science and technologies in innovative ways. And everybody that was involved in this project was as is a climate hero, is really addressing the important issues of the day. Awesome. And then lastly, uh, we thank the audience uh, for sharing this final event with us and celebrating the impact uh, as well. So I'm going to turn it back over to, to Amy. And again, uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for participating. Thank you, Emmeline and Eric, um, for those remarks and for everything that you do. Um, and thank you again all for, for, for joining us. Um, this is the end of our ceremony and, a, and of our time together tonight. Uh, it was a real privilege to be here with you. I, I personally don't think a lot about satellite data in and out. I'm working sort of more on the policy and community side of this challenge. So it was really eye-opening and encouraging um, uh, to see the potential for collaboration and action at so many at so many different levels. Um, so a heartfelt thanks um, from me. Um, please keep up all the amazing work and innovation that you are leading. Um, I'm really keen to see where um, all these collaborations uh, might lead and where these amazing um, ideas and innovations go. So um, thanks again to sponsors, judges, participants, audience, um, applicants, everyone, and, um, and have a really wonderful night.